my heart is beating just a little bit faster for this Rally GL300 in a, a cherry burst stripe, or a cherry quilt sort of finish. And the reason it is so is because this is the colour of the first rally I had, um, which I eventually sold, complete with Seymour Duncan uh, slash pickups, and and I should have kept it, but I sold it, and and because I didn't really need a Les Paul, I told myself I had too many others. Anyway, I sold it, and um, I missed it ever since. And and now this is Gwyn's um, mm, lovely reminder of such a beautiful thing. So Rally, the strange and wonderful brand name that isn't really that well known, but I've always, since I very first time I encountered them, I was struck by how great these are. In fact, I was having a conversation with somebody, that's a, a replacement by the way, I was having a conversation with somebody online earlier on this week about just how spectacular he thinks his um, rally is his GL300, the Les Paul style copy is, and uh, he says it's better than the Gibson Les Paul he's got in his home, and he plays the rally more because he prefers it. So the reason I like these so much were two main reasons. The first was that the setup that they came with, normally, the certainly the Les Paul shape ones, normally came with an incredibly low uh, accurate setup or it seemed that the fret work out the factory was fantastic. Um, and the second aspect was the pickups, in my experience, not when well, I'm not a connoisseur, but in my experience, the pickups were completely capable. They were, you didn't even have to think about replacing them. They were that good. And also it had a, a little short headstock compared to the Epiphones of the time, which were these, uh, back then were these humongous, great sort of egghead boffin looking things that came to about here. And even smaller than the Gibson ones, which I think are quite neat and they do the job. Great quality tuners, Jin Ho tuners, they work perfectly. They came originally with a plastic nut and off camera before I start this, I've already replaced the nut because I was listening to something and I didn't want to, I wanted to get started but I didn't want to interrupt myself. So I've done the replacement here. But the original nut that they came with was this thing and it just wasn't great and you could do without it. But it wasn't the end of the world either, you know. Um, we're talking, you know, fine tuning of the tuning stability. So you could play it without changing it, but I always change them. So I uh, also switched over the um, standard bridge there for a replacement roller bridge, which you can see straight away gives you a little bit more intonation room back front to back than the original. And it also gives you the rollers, which are less sharp um, and probably you know a little bit more um, helpful in tuning stability as well. So that's all really you have to do with the rally is sort the nut out, maybe change the bridge. And I do a precision fret leveling. In this case, this one really does need it because this one has some strange amount of um, buzzing and choking out in certain places, which many others I've had haven't had in such um, amount. So this one does need that bit of work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, since I've already made the nut for this, which would normally be the start point for the setup. Apologies, Gwen. I just wanted to get going because I was being greedy and listening to something. In fact, I was listening to Dr. Dr. R um, Richard Starkey. No, no, he's a drummer. Dr. David Starkey's critique of Harry ex-Prince of Wales, no, Harry X, whatever he is, Suff Sussex, Suffolk, you know, the Prince Harry, he was critiquing his stance. Um, anyway, I just wanted to hear that. Uh, so I did that. But that just involved tapping off the nut and fashioning this one and sizing it down so that when we begin, uh, we start out with the nut firmly placed on here. Um, and then basically I dial up the uh, action so that we have just as much, only only as much height as we need to make it play. Um, so at the other end I'm going to also now adjust the up and down action on the bridge, um, but also just have a quick look at the 
the relief and I noticed the relief is pretty huge on here <coughs> excuse me so I'm going to reduce that down um, by flattening the neck a little bit if I can get my hex key firmly in place so if it's too curved I want to put my adjuster in and turn clockwise and tighten the neck and still see it's too <coughs> too curved um, not quite sure why uh, it's got that much. It may have been dialed into it by a previous owner. So it's quite a bit of adjustment I've just done and I can see it straightening it out. So this will quite substantially change how it feels to play. It's still 0.3 of a mil or something, but a uh, broken E string um, slacking and tightening it. So that's a new E string on there, <coughs> but it's a sacrificial one. Now we've got some uh, what's happening here? That's interesting. Let's have a, just a look around. Okay, we're having now done that adjustment. That's now left our first fret, uh, our strings touching the first fret. So a little bit more adjustment required here. We'll sort of hold it about there. Wow, much, much different. Amazing how much adjusting the truss rod can change the feel of it. Um, now, I always make this point that the truss rod is not the place you go to primarily adjust the playing action. You'd want to do it with the first and last fret. But of course, it has an effect in the center more, more than anything. So when you flatten the neck out with the truss rod, uh, the, the neck, uh, the action feels quite a lot less as you do that in the in the middle where it, where the curvature is most um, uh, you can where you can perceive the curvature most so that you flatten it out the action changes its feel here but you want to so basically the idea is you want to get all three of them to where you want them and they're, they're interrelated so you have a bit of toing and froing to do now I'm using this fabulous Ibanez multi tool here um, and we've got one mil action down here. Now, I know that this rally could probably get away with one mil action, but I'm going to start off by saying that's a little bit ambitious, and I don't think we should strike out for that to begin with. So we'll go for the standard one and a half on that side, and we'll go for the 1.2 on this side, uh, which is my um, whoops, wrong way, <coughs> which is my recommended lowest target action we're about there on both of them actually that's a fraction under one and a half so let's let's begin with that and just see what we've got well it's out of tune obviously I can still hear a very small amount of zing happening on there, so I just want to make sure that's all good. Everything's good here. Everything's good here. Okay, now what I'm going to do now, having set the three things to the composite action that I like, so about 0.2 or 0.3 of a millimetre over the first fret, 1.5 at the last fret low E, and 1.2 last fret high E, and then how would I describe this? It's a bit, um, sounds a bit slapdash, 
uh, more than just none is what I say. So how do I test the radius? I hold the, the low E string down against the first and the last fret simultaneously, and that creates a straight line between them. And then I can, I can press down and see if there's any movement at all, or I any gap between the string and the underlying frets, somewhere about in the middle. And so long as there is, you want just, it, just a little bit. Uh, I started out with too much, and the idea is you go to as little as suits your style of play, and the same applies to this. In fact, the same applies to all three of those components. So you're looking for as little as your playing style uh, can, can suit. Because if you're a heavy hitter, the strings move more, you need more space for them to move somehow, and you either get that by raising these two, or, if necessary, by severely curving this so there's a bit more room in the middle, roughly in the middle where the strings stretch. In fact, the, the points are offset. The neck, the neck bend middle is about here, and the string middle is about here. So the maximum movement of the string is here, and the maximum accommodation is here. Mismatched, as you can tell, but it helps. So it's a mixture of all three, and you're looking for a combination of all three. Um, what would I advise on the neck? Well, I'd always say, if your frets will allow it, or if you're going to level them as we are, um, set your neck as flat as reasonably it can go, but not being dead flat, and certainly not being back bowed. If you go back bowed, and if it changes over time because of environmental conditions, the minute it flattens out completely and starts to go back bowed, you'll lose notes here. They'll choke out when you play down this end because there's a hump in the middle. If that happens, as I was explaining to Darren at home this morning, who came to pick up his guitar, you have to make an adjustment on the truss rod, which will just, uh, if you slacken it, it'll just allow the neck to have a little bit more curvature. If you tighten it, it'll go even more humped. So you have to get comfortable using your truss rod to um, adjust the inevitable environmental changes. This is made of wood, and it's going to move depending on climate. Um, a lot of people are frightened to adjust the truss rod, uh, and because uh, I suppose there's a kind of mythology or a yeah, sort of scary magic built up about it, taboo even. Um, but you need to be able to do it. And the first thing I'd like to say is that you can't break it. Um, I've tried deliberately to break a truss rod by turning this, and I couldn't do it. So you know, you'd have to really work hard to break it. Not a single one of you would break it in normal use, okay? Uh, you'd have to, you would know if you were turning it so hard you could possibly shear the weld on the, um, on either end of this rod. Um, so that's the first thing to dispel. And the second thing to say is you do need to be able to do it. And the only way you're going to get to do it is to do what I'm going to do now, okay? I don't know if you, how well you can see me, but this is my, I'm inviting you. You get your whichever doofer you're using. I'm using this one. I'll just change that to that. But I'm going to now tighten it as hard as I can go. <laughs> there you go. Oh, but Sam, you've just set it up. Why did you do that? You've ruined your setup. Well, I did it because I can go back. Now let's hear how it plays. A minute ago it was playing, if you recall. Let's get, a, get me a plectrum. It's a Dirty Graph Tech one. Oh, look. Well, straight away, we've lost the open string there. So that change in curvature has stolen away the space that was there. That doesn't play at all. Remember I told you, with too much uh, tension, it goes back bowed and notes before the middle point. After, you can play them, but notes down here killed. Not all of them, but certainly those. Now, does it feel flat? Oh yeah, I mean, it feels like there's no action at all. Changes the action here, changes the action there. Um, but mostly in the middle, hence why we lose the notes just before the middle. So, I don't like that. I can check how much impact it's had. There is not any space. There is no space at all. So, hey, let's do it completely the other way. But Sam, you're going to ruin your setup. It goes all the way. It's a two-way truss rod. Oh, I can hear it creaking. Now I've cranked it completely the other way. And what have we got now? My God, the action's a mile high. Well, it is because it's completely changed the curvature of this neck. Now all, 
the open notes are playing. They're uh, a mile high everywhere you look. And if you hold this down, there's about, three, I'm going to be honest, there's about two and a half millimeters of space here. Now, what it means is you've given it uh, as much, um, you've given it more than enough space for all the strings. You'll never get any fret buzz, even if your frets are uneven, because you've created all this extra room by this huge bow. But if I look at it under here, it's miles too big. So we just, if you, this happened to you, or if the environment changed and it changed for you, all you do is get your truss rod adjuster out and you go, all right, let's just take it to the slack point, right? Let's leave it settle. We're at, if I can get this thing out, come on. Sometimes this happens. <laughs> See if I can actually remove this. Not really any good reason why this should get stuck, but sometimes they do. How annoying. <laughs> Look at that, doesn't want to come out. I'm going to do a little bit of forced movement. Come on, out you come. Unbelievable. It doesn't actually want to come out. Let's go another way. Right now it does. Um, yes, so that was just a, to do with the ball end on that. It's got a sort of angled ball end. So what did I do? I, um, I went to the neutral point, which is still too much curvature by miles. So we do need to dial it out. So we get hold of it and we turn it again. And we go to, it was a kind of dead point right in the middle there. And then we come to the tightening bit. And you can look at it, you can see the curvature. And I'm going to dial it out. If you remember, I had to go quite far. So that feels about right. And the, you see, I'm not doing any clever measurements or anything. It's sort of resettling. Still got a little, well, there's enough room. Strings are very dead, so it's not giving you a good account of itself. But um, so we're back somewhere close to where we were, and we can tweak it. Say, ah, oh, fraction too much. I'll try this one. Okay, fraction too much. Well, how much more shall I tweak it? Let's put that in. Make sure it's biting. Let's go that much. No, no measurements. No special devices. Hardly any movement, but there is some. Okay, so I'm back where I was. These haven't changed, this has changed, and now we're back in a sort of range of action. We can play everything. Now, if it's fractionally too flat, you might want to just kind of tweak it until you're at a point that you're totally comfortable with to begin <coughs> your adjustments of everything, like your fret leveling. That's, that's enough. Uh, I'm happy with that. So now I'm back to where I wanted to be. Do you see how easy that was? There was nothing broke, nothing magical about it. Um, didn't do any harm to anything. It massively changed the whole arrangement of the neck. And so when I've gone about not using the truss rod to set up your, or to, to adjust your playing action, I think I'm kind of maybe being a bit dogmatic or harsh on that. It, of course it adjusts it, but it's, it's, I try to think of it as a, a secondary um, effect of what you're really trying to do with the truss rod first and foremost is to create enough spin room for your strings in the mid part of the neck. <laughs> in a way, <laughs> that's what you, you'd be better off thinking of your truss rod as that, for that purpose. Okay, so I'm going to um, mark up these frets and what we're going to get is uh, a look once we start doing very gentle leveling we're going to get a sort of diagnostic and that's what I like about this fret leveling method uh, is how it, if you learn to read it it'll tell you <coughs> what's happening with the neck obviously it will tell you where the high and low frets are but it will also tell me 
about the sort of over, what I call the overall geometry of the neck. Now notice I haven't um, glued the nut in yet. I'm just I'm just looking at that. Is there some slight unevenness here? I wonder what that's from. It's from a build-up of glue, I think. Don't want to change it too much. There's a sort of cut down there. Somebody's sort of cut into there somehow, but it's okay. It more or less will sit on there, and then once we come to glue it down, it will stay where we want. Um, yeah, so there's the there's what I call the overall geometry. Um, so when you think about individual frets being high or low, they, it's clearly an issue because when they're high or low, they cause the next fret to choke out um, because they get in the way of play. Um, but as well as there being individual high and low frets causing problems with playing, there is also another aspect of the neck, which is the overall clusters of high and low frets. So you take a little chunk of it, and there might be one high fret in that chunk, but actually that whole chunk may well be higher than the next chunk, which is a valley by comparison. So this method of fret leveling help, helps to not only iron out individual high and low frets, but also to tame that overall hilly and valley geometry that can cause what I call fret slab. Almost in tune, apart from that. So what I'm doing now, if I'm just getting these vaguely to tune, I'm not really caring too much about stretching everything out of them. I just, I just want them, I'll do them one more tuning and then they'll be under enough tension to do the leveling. Okay, so let's recap. New nut fitted, new bridge fitted, action reduced to where I want it. Remember, the overall playing action is a combination of the three things. Your first and last fret actions set here by the adjustable nut. If you don't have an adjustable nut, it's set by the depth of the nut slots. Set by the adjustable nut here, the bridge height here, and of course, affected overall by the curvature or relief in the neck set by the truss rod. But if you keep it in your mind that the truss rod's purpose most of all is to have a little bit of, create a little bit of space for the um, strings to move about. Now of course you, you can play it dead flat but you'll have to probably go a little bit higher with your action. If you want to go lower with your action you can get away with by having a little bit of relief in the neck, but it's a balance between those two things, or three things if you take these as separates. Balance between those three things. When you get a bit of experience, you can learn how to kind of balance them all up together um, until you've got what you want, which is right there. Now I'm going to um, fret level, for which I need my whoops, little box of tricks, which I've been carrying around in these glasses case for since I started, so they've done a lot of good service, these little brass dome knob things, and they all get the same treatment, and they all get sort of rotated, so they, if they're wearing down, they wear down at the same rate as each other. So we're going, da -da -da -da, and then we're going up to there, I always forget which is the one. So the aim now is I've got a certain amount of curvature in this neck and I'm going to, using these three sample points, three points on a curve, one there, one down there, one up there, put it crudely, and that doesn't describe everything, it just describes those three points. So what I do is I tune this truss rod in such a way that it copies or it, it bends to the curve described by these three sample points. Once you do that, 
what you've got, which I haven't got yet, uh, once you do that, what you have is you have a smooth curve that conforms, touches these three sample points at the same time. That means you've got a smooth version of the curve that these three points describe. But the funny part is, of course, is that the curve, the real curve underneath, behind those three points, is actually not as smooth as the curve on this. So now we've got two interesting, or when I get there, we will have two interesting things. We will have a real imperfect curve, which is this neck that sort of broadly does that, but it does it in a series of little humps and waves. And thanks to this sampling method, brilliant little piece of simple physics, we've now got a smooth linear curve which approximates that curve but is much smoother than it. So what do you imagine happens if you put a, a smooth curve onto a shaggy curve? Well, the smooth curve is going to help to um, iron out the shaggy ups and downs on this rough thing. And that's what I learned over the last eight years is the real benefit of this system. Of course, it lowers and tidies up high and low frets, but not only does it do that, it also irons out the larger scale ups and downs of the fretboard. And that is something I didn't know at the beginning and I've learned in the period of time I've been doing this. And and it accounts, those two things um, account for two different kinds of um, buzz which I've defined for my working purposes as there's the kind of buzz that, and choke that we know is caused by a high fret. And that I call fret buzz, high or a low fret. Um, we've, we're familiar with it, we play a note and it's just dead or uh, it's, it's hissy or buzzy. That's caused by one single fret and you can usually find one or two on a whole neck and then you, can, you have to lower that fret. Or if it's a low one, it still has the same buzz because the next one is effectively high, even though it isn't high compared to everything else, it's high compared to the one behind it. And to even that out, to cure that effect, you have to um, gently even out the two. You have to bottom out the low spot. That means bringing the regular bits down halfway. Um, so it should be able to make sense straight away that low frets are actually more costly of fret metal overall than high frets. But that's the one kind of buzz. The other kind of buzz is a rattle that is noticeable because first and foremost, it doesn't happen on just one spot where you'd expect a high fret or a low fret to cause buzz. It happens on a whole series of frets, sometimes half the fingerboard. And that, I found out, is caused by the, uh, the lack of enough space in this wavy overall long wavy length of the key, uh, fretboard. Um, so that the moving string clips these high spots. And again, if you then think about the whole thing as uh, a curve and, and not think about the individual things, we can then use this tool to gently iron out the multiple hills and valleys. So you're kind of zooming out from single frets is a hill and a valley. Zooming out, you've got hills and valleys across the whole board. And this is a great method for addressing both. But I have to think of them as separate activities because without that, um, it's really only one activity, but I, I, it helps to think of it as two because it explains what's happening to my way of thinking. Now I'm going to show you something straight away. I did a, um, well, I did Darren's uh, Ibanez, it, beautiful Ibanez Prestige, J Japan, Japan made guitar. And the first thing I noticed when I did the first fret level on the what I call the E track, which is down there, I noticed that every single fret uh, cut at the same time. And that showed the overall, uh, well, the lack of hills and valleys. There were still a couple of issues around fret slap over here, but mainly it was a beautiful neck, an unusually flat neck. And that's partly because it was a laminate made of at least three pieces, or probably five if you take some veneers in between. But we have something very different going on here. So uh, I'm going to stay far out so you can see the light effect. So it tells you straight away, you can maybe spot with me, this is cutting a lot, right? So we've got... Not much, not much, not much, a lot, not much, none, 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 none. So look at that. That is your first, there's your average lands, there's a highland, there's a lowland, okay, the valley, and then we're coming up and it goes cut, cut, heavily cut, heavily cut. So another high peak over here. 
So two high peaks in the overall geometry of this, cutting, none, 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 cutting right at the end. So we've got two distinct low valley areas, really low areas. There's one there and there's one right there. So you can see that if we want to have the cleanest plane possible um, neck, the, the hills and valleys that this is revealing to us, although they're not they're not strictly individual high frets causing problems, but they are showing that over this neck there's about three or four distinct, or maybe five actually. Uh, let's have a look. So one, one, two, three, four, five distinct spaces, areas. Um, if we want to take care of it, we have to address that with this idea of the uh, imposing this perfect curve on this imperfect hilly topography. And it's different mentality to the individual fret leveling. So you can also see that the dust is building up where it's cutting most. So you can almost immediately zoom in on a problem area. There's one there, you can see the dust either side of it, and there's clearly one around about there with the dust building up. Now, interestingly, the lack of room caused by these hills and valleys isn't so much a problem on the low, uh, the high strings, because they don't move very much, but it's that that basic topography here causes a problem down on these fatter strings, the, particularly the E, because they, they are under less tension and they spin more. So, although we don't really have to work too hard or concentrate too hard on ironing all of this out on the top frets, oops, the top strings, I should say, because if I just put you back here, um, if I, because if I take the spring spring spacer, string spacer off there, put it back, put the string back in, and play this now, um, what you'll hear is that every string appears to play. Even with what we can see as being some unevenness still un under there because we're cutting a lot here, a lot here, and then there's clearly ups and downs. But it's telling us that the action we've chosen and the level, the flatness of the neck, um, that's enough leveling to make everything play. There's a hint of that fret there, the bad one, getting in the way of these nut notes here. So actually, before we move on, I might just do a tiny bit more down this end with a focus on here, because that fret there, as a single fret, is actually now threatening threatening to uh, affect those low notes or notes played low down on the neck there. So I'm just going to do a little bit more everywhere. One of the things about going a little bit further, even though we don't have to, is you can quickly tell how, um, how bad the hills and valleys are. In fact, these aren't too bad. They're just starting to pick up cutting there. This one's a deeper and it's quite common that you get this sort of uh, I don't know. It's uh, it's usually it's usually a bit higher at that end, but we've got a, a lower bit. But again, if it plays at the tr the treble strings, tr sorry, treble strings, yeah, the treble strings now play. All the way up, that's fine. And actually, you know, if we just double check, we're dealing with a very low action. Um, I'm happy with that, even though I know there's still some unevenness in there. The point being is the unevenness is below a level that it bothers me, so I can afford to leave it there. Now, with other methods of fret leveling, you don't have the choice to do that. You tend to level until there's no rocking or clicking with your fret rocker, and the downside of that is that you go until it's mechanically flat, and actually in doing that, you almost certainly have taken away more metal than you need because the point is you don't need to remove the unevenness below the action you've chosen. And of course the other method where you're leveling without the strings in place can't tell you that. It, it just it can only aim for and achieve an, uh, an overall arbitrary flatness, levelness. So again I'm seeing Dust, a lot of dust building up on the high spots still, and that's that's going to have to be how it is if we want the thing to play like slippery butter, as they say. It became such an 80s, 70s, 80s type of expression. It kind of makes you 
shudder when you read it in ads. Plays like butter. No, it just plays beautifully. I mean, there's barely any height of action there, there which is, again, great for tuning stability. That's pretty good. That's a very low action. So now I'm going to recalibrate for the G track. Now the G track is where you often have um, problems with chokeouts when you're bending the E and the B string. Um, so I'm going to calibrate for the B and level that. Now let's just have a look. How's the calibration going? We're still pretty much flat on, spot on. The calibration thing is, again, an experience gained thing. Uh, it's not that hard to know when it's uh, when the thing is touching equally in all places, but it is a feel thing, so you have to get some experience. Um, like I say, I've got eight years of experience now doing this, and you know, some people still come to my Facebook or YouTube and tell me it's that I'm doing it wrong and you can't do it like that, and you should just just take the strings off and do it like normal people and it, I would do if it hadn't been producing good results consistently for the last eight years so um, and I end, end up re reply, replying to them as politely as I can that I hope they will understand if I I base my decisions on my day-to-day -day experience not their online knowledge okay so the G string Good. Now try a bend. That's good. Now before I was losing the B as I was bending it across the G. So we freed that up. So we're on we're on a winner. It has taken a bit of more leveling than, for example, the Ibanez I was speaking about, because it was definitely a much hillier neck by miles. Um, and I think that's probably you know, the difference between the expensive top of the range um, Ibanez Prestige Jap Japanese, I was always getting Japanese, Japan, Japanese made uh, guitars with that laminate construction. It's just a really good idea to make a laminate construction neck. Um, and I'm certainly going to be looking at doing that on a bass build that I've um, got on for somebody. Um, because it just makes sense to do it, to counter the tendency of the neck to bend when you don't want it to bend, or probably more importantly, to twist and deform when you don't want it to twist and deform. Um, actually, I just recently made that very wide, I call it the X, ultra wide, ultra, ultra wide six string for uh, a customer, and I put carbon fiber rods in the neck as while well, I was building it to stiffen it. And I, of course, I, I didn't really need them. So what I ended up with was a stiff neck. Um, thankfully, it ended up being, I ended up being able to dial in enough relief, the, the relief I needed. Um, but it nearly caught me out because I hadn't anticipated that being so much thicker or what's so not thicker, so much wider than the average neck, it was going to be a lot stronger and thicker than an average neck, and it wouldn't need the carbon fiber. Now, you might have noticed there, I just made an adjustment to the curvature of this rod for this track. And the reason I did that is because at this point, for reasons unknown to me, but I don't need to know, I just need to follow, the, follow the, what it's telling me. At that point, this side of the radius, the neck has a little bit less relief in it. So I adjusted my um, this leveling beam to suit. Now I'm working on the base side now, and on the base side, it always tends to be much more about um, ironing out these multiple hills and valleys so that we don't get this what I call fret slap. So if I look at it now, um, we've got over on this side, we've got possibly a bit more evenness than the this side which is quite interesting so the base side is 
by default a little bit less of the ups and downs but let's test how it sounds now I've been leveling very gently a little bit there only a tiny bit though so it's going well um, now this this guitar has come I think with tens on it but I'm I know that Green has asked for nines so I've got my nines out I think these are tens anyway it's hard to measure them the, the mic micro cal the calipers don't qu quite always tell you the truth about string gauges um, when you measure them up okay <clears throat> and we're now down to calibrating for the final e track um, so that's a all, all over that's an interesting neck clearly got some actually more problems on the more hills and valleys over on the treble side than on the bass side which is not common but that's what you get everything's every guitar is just a little bit different um, and of course it's it's organic it's wood it does whatever it wants from the outset and it does whatever it wants over time <coughs> um, you know and <coughs> loads of discussions regularly with people who talk about you know they've got a guitar with uh, a neck that's either twisted or or permanently curved you know that doesn't have a truss rod and you know should they bend it or steam it and there's all kinds of solutions you, you know ways you can do it and tutorials and <coughs> so on and so forth um, but I have to say one of the things that I never really had any faith in is steaming wood that has a sort of an organic and perhaps convoluted grain that wants to do its own thing um, I've never had any faith in steaming that forcing it into do what I need it to do and then hope that it won't revert back according to what the sort of stored memory of what the grain wants to do is um, which is why I just don't do it I've, I just don't think it's worth it um, tiny bit around there on the 12th fret but that's about it yeah so I just I don't know it's, it, it's one of those things that takes so much effort to steam it clamp it wait come back try it out um, and if it's a customer's guitar you know to possibly send it back in the hope that it's going to stay good for years and and if it doesn't a couple of months down the line the, the sheer misery for both of you of somebody coming back saying it's gone back and it's no longer the right shape and you know what do you do for them then you you've charged them because you've done all the work and yet you just have to say to them oh well I'm just sorry it doesn't it doesn't work and we couldn't you know couldn't guarantee it and that's it you have a unplayable guitar despite having spent the money so I'd, I would rather not build up hopes in that respect okay so the, the fret leveling part is done I informally chatted all the way through it now we're in a in a fairly straightforward spot now where we can take off these strings and bin them and while the strings off it's a good time to clean much of the guitar out as we can I think I might take the tuners off here and clean the headstock up because a fresh headstock a freshly cleaned headstock is a very nice oh I'll tell you what I'm going to do hold fire it's a very nice thing um, I'm just going to am I going to do it now no, I'll say I won't do that now. I'll save it till later. I was going to put the glue on there and I'm going to sneeze. Editing machine. <coughs> Pardon me. Saved you from that. I think. Well, maybe not. So, yeah. So the, the one thing about the adjustable nut when it's um, glued at the base it will stay in place 
technically the top is loose or it's free and it can come out so I do recommend that when you have one of my adjustable nuts you fit the middle two strings first or when you're removing the strings you take off the outsides and leave the middle strings in last and then fit them first the other way around just so it holds down the that insert part of the nut and it can't go anywhere so I'm just going to cut these sacrificial strings off they've served their country well and these bits can go in the bin so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to recrown the, the frets and I'm going to clean everything else up um, probably off camera and then off camera as well I'm going to do all the polishing of the frets and then just come back on for fitting the new strings and stretching them out you can see it's a fairly dirty process so I get a rag or two to just sort of keep the, the dust a little bit at bay but again we're going to take get the cloth in there with some that green polishing compound and just get everything a little freshened up it would be nice to take guitars like this to the buffer buffing wheel but the problem with that is that you'd have to take the pickups out and stuff it's a bit too much trouble to try and cover them up and buff around them i'm not sure that's very workable but um so what we do is we get hold of our pen again and th these fingerboard is quite dirty too so this is going to clean up nicely in a minute so we've done the leveling and that's resulted in some flat spots on the frets um, which is necessity to get the level right but we don't want flat spots because it doesn't feel great doesn't look great and also if they're very flat which these aren't but if they're the flatter they are the more likely they'll interfere with your intonation because the intonation point for the string moves to the um, uh, moves to the bridge wood side of the flat spot. So if it's really flat, it'll be um, up to a millimeter or possibly even more away from the center line of the fret, which is where it should be for its correct intonation. So the idea after having leveled it is mark all the frets up again. And now I'm going to use my Stumac crowning file on the medium gauge, medium jumbo side of it to run down the frets and it's a concave file with diamond stuff on it and it rounds off the sharp edges of the flat spots and rounds them in towards the middle but I stop doing that at the point where I make sure to leave a little thin as thin as possible a strip of marker pen down the center of the fret and that tells me I've rounded the shoulders the square shoulders off but I've left this bit in the middle so I haven't reduced the height of the fret and that's really critical because it would, if we reduce the height of the fret at all we'd be wasting the leveling work we just did which would be stupid so this is only about well, it's very important to leave that little thin line of black marker pen and that's why the marker pen does such a great job of telling us what's going on now this one is I know it's been pretty heavily hit because it was substantially high on the edge this one so we won't get a perfect shape all the way out of this but we'll go quite some way towards it you won't notice when it's shined up and polished back but having done the leveling you'll know which of the frets has the greatest flat spot because it's the one that cut the most uh, you know we saw the dust coming off it we could tell and we could see the flat spot okay so we'll do all of this and then once I've got to the end of here, I'm going to go into a boring period of uh, cutting lots of little pieces of masking tape to cover off the fretboard. And then we'll do polishing and then finally a big old clean everywhere. Um, and then come back on camera and do the putting the hardware back together again, rechecking the action. Great thing about this method of setup is we can take all the hardware off. Um, because I know that once I put the nut in, the bridge and the stop bar back on, load up the strings again, everything about this neck and this guitar will go back to exactly the setup it was before we took the strings off. Because it will behave the same way once we put new strings on, providing they're the same gauge. Of course, if we go a heavier gauge, it will pull a little bit more relief into the neck. Um, if we go a lighter gauge, 
it will leave the neck a fraction flatter. So we have to be aware of that. Um, and in case we're going from tens to nines right now, then we be on the lookout for it flattening out the neck a little bit. But then we know how to make a tiny tweak right at the end. If we want a little bit more room on our relief, we can do that at any time because we know how. So, working my way up to you, babe, with a burning love inside. You shouldn't be able to say those words. That's a copyrighted song. Imagine the word the. Burning. Love. <sighs> Copyright the word love. YouTube algorithms going through every single video. He said love. Yes, that's owned by Northern Records or Northern Songs. The Beatles own the word love. Of course they do. Anyway. So I have to say, January has started out nicely busy, I'm very grateful to say. Uh, December was a little quiet and I was, I got into one of those finishing off lots of prepaid work scenarios, which is great, a, a real luxury to have um, you know, prepaid work when you need the money in and so on. But then it becomes a drag because, you know, you're still doing it when you run out of money for the next month. <laughs> anyway, that's not the end of the world, but it's worked out nicely and I've got, so I had a lot of this sort of prepaid building stuff going on over the Christmas break. A little bit tight on cash, um, but January comes in, has come in a bit busier than I expected, so I'm pleased about that. Kept me kept me busy and, uh, and you know, got some good things coming in like this. Who Who isn't happy about setting up a Rally GL300. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to do some cleaning off camera because it's just polishy boring stuff. I'm going to do the polishing out here and the cleaning of the neck and come back to you when um, this is basically shiny, ready to put the strings back on. We'll put new strings on, I should say, and get it right sorted out. And then there'll be a matter of stretching the strings out and intonating them, and then the guitar will be ready to go. So a lot of um, the little bits get done off camera like the nut in this case I did off camera um, and the polishing out I'll do off camera just because it's boring and noisy there's lots of scr scratching of sandpaper and I get to charge the batteries up on my things and and um, have a drink so see you in a bit so welcome back oh sorry headphone yeah. welcome back welcome back I forgot to put the headphone on so look shiny everything polished front and back Headstock polished, tuners returned, put on, back on. So it's all looking good. All the grime removed from the fretboard. All that finger stripey grime gone, ready to be oiled. So that's the next thing to do. So I'm just going to move you over there a minute. Things in the way. Just stay there for a second. There, right. So we're just going to do the oily bit. And then we'll do... The stringing up and after the stringing we'll do the stretching and after the stretching we'll do the intonating so this is i don't know what kind of wood this is i can never remember but it's not really it's not rosewood it's that other thing anyway um i mean it's good looking uh it's not bad looking but it doesn't absorb oil much but it's just a little bit of kind of darkening cleaning effect really and it does make it look nicer but we want to sort of rub off the excess because it doesn't really go anywhere and it will just kind of evaporate and dry on the surface oh, no not evaporate so much it will just dry on the surface and if you leave it it tends to make a bit of a sticky paste as much as anything else so a little bit is good and then we'll just wipe off the excess if we can and then we'll go from there so, one of the things I always talk about at this point in time, and it must be really boring for those who've heard it hundreds of times, and if you think it's boring hearing it hundreds of times, you can imagine what it's like saying it hundreds of times. Uh, and that is, I'm down this end at the moment, you can't, well, you might be able to see here. I'm uh, fitting the hardware bits. But what I say at this time, this point every 
setup is that tuning stability on your guitar is actually very simple right and we taught we taught or we kind of seem to when we're younger we absorb all kinds of Okay, okay. <laughs> we absorb all kinds of mythology about these things, um, you know, that say you've got to do certain things to keep tuning stable, or you've got to buy certain equipment. It often comes down to stories about what you've got to buy for it to work for you. Now, it's a myth because tuning stability actually comes down to two things. 50% the tuning stability is dependent on the quality of your nut and 50% is dependent on the uh, on you wringing out the slack in your strings the unreleased slack in your strings now that might sound a bit too simple but it actually is that simple amazingly so I'm just going to put a tiny of glue on here and I'm going to fit this right now push it into place, line it up, get it where I feels right and then I'm going to push it down and hold it there under finger pressure for a minute. Yes, so two components, the quality of your nut slots and the amount of unreleased slack in your strings. And that's it. So you get those two bits right, everything will go well. So choosing a tusk nut with the correct slots or perfectly cut nut slots and with a material that's built in friction free which is the Teflon embossed material that they make Tusk out of um, gives you the best possible uh, tuning stability from the nut perspective and um, and then the, the other half of the deal is making sure you get the stretching of your strings right and we'll do that in a minute but once you get those two things done, your guitar will stay in tune, even if you've got crappy, uh, you know, late 1970s Japan Taisco style tuners, or you know, uh, early Squire cheapo tuners. They aren't important. They not they don't have a consequential effect on your tuning stability. Of course, they have an effect on how it feels to tune. And so, you know, if you've got money, go ahead and spend it on quality engineered great looking uh, tuners and so on because uh, you know there will be a much more um, positive and direct feel if you've got you know high gearing uh, tuners versus you know the, the cheaper ones with a lower or whichever way around it is lower gearing but just remember that they don't cause your guitar to go in or out of tune it's all that is down to the nut and the slack in your strings so what I'm doing now is I'm just going to line up the uh, holes in the posts ready so I can tune them up or tighten them up without too much hassle. Okay, so here we are. We're going to go with the middle ones first to hold the nut down, make sure the insert doesn't go anywhere. So on this, I pull it through, put it on the uh, saddle at the other end, put the string on the saddle at the other end, I'm trying to keep the string, this other string, the G string, out of the way for a minute, pull it through, and I'm going to now grip it at this first fret, and I'm going to pull it back one fret. Uh, I'm not going to do that in a minute. I'm going to go and get my screwdriver because I'm going to use the uh, tuner. Which way am I going? Wrong way. Okay. So let's go back again. Right, first string in. That's the D into the right place. Grab it at the first fret, pull back, and then hold it. And then what we'll do? God. So we'll start turning the key and we'll hold this tight, so we cause it to kink. And then as we hold this, we keep it, keep it tight. So this is our held string. The held string goes over the loose string. So the loose string goes under and comes round again. And as it comes round again, we grab the loose string, yank it up, and this time, still keeping the tension, we direct the held string under the loose string. So it goes under there and kind of locks itself nicely in place and there we have it. I'll just go through, that's, that's actually too tight but I just wanted to get round so I could reach 
the end and cut the spare bit off and then I'll slack it off now. Okay. So what I can see straight away is I don't have the action set right down this end, but I'm not worried about that just for now because we've taken the bridge off, we've moved the nut around, we've done all kinds of things, but we'll, we'll readjust all of that. So next one I'll do the G, and again, same thing, come up to the end, hold it, hold it tight, pull it back one. Now this time I have to hold with the thumb because I've got to work upside down, and I want the held bit to go over the loose bit as it comes round, grab it and I grab this and I'm holding it under tension so it doesn't coil off anywhere. And then the held string goes underneath this time. And again, it's a little bit more than two wraps, but that's plenty to hold the string. Now, if you try and do too little, you can get into trouble because the plain strings do have a tendency to want to pull off if you're less than two wraps. So always, don't, don't skimp on the wraps. It doesn't store up that much uh, excess uh, string to store slack, uh, but it's better to uh, stretch the excess slack out than it is to have too little grip. Okay, so again, same principle. So now, of course, the, the nut is now held in place. There's no chance of the, the insert coming off. Again, that's gone around just far enough so I can cut the end off and then come back. Now this is all obviously too low, but we'll take care of that in a minute. Now I can do the high E. So when we come to stretching it, it's, it's not like stretching that we used to do when we were school kids. Uh, I don't know, there's no finar involved here in terms of we used to just string our guitars up and get playing. When you stretch them now, you want to, you've got to keep stretching them until there's no more detuning occurs. And we never would have had the patience to do that as kids. If, if, certainly I would never would have done. You know, we used to, we used to think a bit of tugging <coughs> and, and that was done and everything would be fine from that point onwards. And of course it wasn't and we wondered why it kept going out of tune. Well, what I can tell you is you put the time into tuning it or stretching it until there's no more detuning and then you will be rewarded by uh, tuning stability. And I, and I know it sounds like when I talk about it every time, it sounds like some dro droning old professor going on about something for the sake of it. But, um, yeah, that's right. Um, the difference it makes I found in my experience of many years now, the difference it makes is as big as whether you take a, a guitar off the peg and play it, or whether you just kind of tend to find yourself leaving it there. And often we don't even really know why, but it will be the one that you struggle to get into tune every time you pull it down from the peg is the one that you will not reach for. Um, the, the weird and wonderful one that shouldn't be the one that stays in tune but just happens to be have no slack or a good enough fitted is the one we find ourselves drawn towards and my position on this has always been well it should be you should have that feeling about every one of your guitars and there's no reason why you can't if you do this another way okay so there's the strings all loaded on <coughs> So we better zoom out or something. Let's see what we're looking at. Okay, zoom out. Okay, zoom right out. Um, so I'm just gently pulling all the strings first to make sure they're all bedded down. Don't want them too tight for a second. Just want to make them make sure they're seated. So now what I want to do is go back to the first fret action, sorry, last fret action that we had before. And it's very easy to do. I can see there's absolutely none there at all. So I'm going to raise up the bridge until I get back. Uh, it's got to be quite high up this baby. Hmm. I never knew, I never realized it was that far up. Okay, so we're just gonna 
keep going. Now in a minute, it will need to put a bit more tightness on the, what's it? I'm just guessing at the tuning right now. I'm just doing it so I can make a better guess or assessment of the height. Now what I also did on this guitar is I think there's a very big angle, um, an ex quite an extreme angle between the stop bar and this bridge. And that's partly because this bridge sits so high up. Uh, and that's to do with the natural, the default factory set of the neck. They've done it, they've made this guitar in such a way that it requires quite a high neck fixture, or sorry, high bridge fixture. So that's about where we are. And that, I don't know how well you can see that, but that's quite high off the off its a bit screws right but that's okay um, but what I did was I raised the stop bar up a little bit with it and we can that's okay we, we don't want it to be too steep now you could ask me a technical question and you could say Sam why don't you want it to be too steep and I don't really have a good answer and there'll be forums somewhere in this world dedicated to just discussing that one thing I don't know the answer. <laughs> okay, so now we've got our strings back on, our strings on, our bridge where we think is about right. We'll job, double check the neck relief, a tiny bit of neck relief. First fret action, very, very low indeed, perfect. And we'll just double check our last fret action, a 1.3 and a 1.3. So really, we technically do want to be a tiny fraction up on here. There's no point being so low that we just invite problems for ourselves. Okay, I think that's pretty good. Now it's going to be slightly out of tune. I'll tune it one more time, then we'll stretch it. Now, this tuner is a little bit creaky, um, gritty, and I would say that if, if um, Gwyn, if you're in the, I want to treat myself mode, and why not, um, then a new set of tuners, you know, Grovers or something, which would be like for like in terms of weight, uh, they would no doubt get rid of that slightly crunchy gearing on that one. It's not a major issue and it won't have anything to do with the guitar staying in tune. It'll just be how it feels to tune it up. Okay, so the stretching part is vital. So we pick up the string and we press with thumb and forefinger to stretch it out. And what will happen is that whatever, wherever the slack lives, whatever it is that makes it detune, we will be detuning it. Now, I, I've tried to find millions of ways of describing how important this is to do. And what I did a couple of weeks ago is I took a freshly fitted string, I tuned it up to an A or something, and I gave it a big yank, um, and it went down to drop uh, a tone, easily dropped a tone in just a pull. So let's take that tone and we say that just with one pull, that detuned a whole tone and Imagine that's a hundred cents or parts. Uh, and imagine that two cents, three cents is enough to make your guitar noticeably out of tune if you're musical or ear, if you've got a musical ear, so that you won't enjoy playing it. So that's, you've got at least, if it's two, to uh, two cents, you've got sort of 50 little out of tunes stored up in that one tone's worth of stretch. And actually there, over time when you repeat it, there's probably about two tones in total. Now that means, you know, you could have a hundred slight, slight detunings, I mean, this is a crude way of stating it, but a hundred such slight detunings stored up in each string, ready for you to just push it out. There's one of them stretched out, so that's gone down by two cents, three cents, and now you're slightly out of tune. 
oh, there's only 99 more such detunings to go to spoil your playing. So from that point of view, you can imagine that will take forever just playing it, tuning it, playing it again. So I'm, so I'm trying to get across the idea that without you manually stretching this out and going wringing every bit of it out, that um, the slack with its potential to detune you for the tiniest physical distance of string is going to haunt you plague you. Plague you for a long time. It could be as much as years and I've had people bring guitars that they've restrung years ago and they bring them and you can stretch them and before you know it they're way out of tune even though the person thinks that they will have stretched them when they put their strings on a year and a half ago or whenever it was. Um, and you can just, there's a whole bunch of detuning just waiting, coiled up in the coils on the post. And it's not the fact that it's there, because coiling anything or putting any string on will always store up some of that slack. It's the fact that it's not being consciously or deliberately removed. Now, the thing about doing these strings this way is it is a little bit fierce, so you have to be careful on your top thin strings or else you can quite easily break them. So there's still plenty to pull out. But it will eventually reduce. But it's good to get shot of it all at the beginning. And um, if you do it, you'll, like I say, you'll be rewarded with that and the nut which we've done now, that bit's done. So the, the stretching is down to you from this point onwards. Closer. Good. One more stretch along here. So this will be the third such stretch. And you know, you're also trying to get rid of the stretch that's behind that nut. Oops, behind the nut as well. Not too fierce on those thin strings, Samuel. Which never was my name, by the way. In fact, my name was never Sam. My weird parents named me Michael. And then called me Sam forevermore. So I've had this schizophrenia personality thing with my name all my life. That's, that's not to belittle or downplay the important seriousness of that psychological condition. Schism, whatever the word might be. Duality, you know what I mean. I've, I've lived under two different names. Okay, I think we're there. Good, that's the stretching done. Now, there's one step to do, and that is the intonation. And for this we will use, we need the, double check that, that could possibly do with a tighten up. Just double checking the intonation now with the tuner. And I'm going to use my old tried and tested support mechanism because I don't hate putting that down with that thing touching the floor. So the 
aim of the intonation check is to tune the pinged harmonic to exactly E and then fret it. So see straight away that's an E, that's a pinged harmonic. When I press it, it's a bit lower, so it's flat. So that tells me that the string length is slightly too long for this length uh, for this neck, which means I will get my screwdriver out, and I will. Uh, will I, I think I will. Uh, for this purpose, I'll just slack off these strings a little bit. Now, when you slack your strings off for a job like this, you will have to just slightly stretch them a bit again, gently, um, because you you kind of allowing a little bit of slack to creep back in. But the reason I want to slack them off is I, I want to make an adjustment now and I don't want to be fighting with this little screwdriver at a slightly odd angle. I don't want to be fighting with this um, uh, screw head because it's a, quite a strong chance that you'll strip it out and make a mess. So, so now what I've done is because I've taken a guide from, I trust, I trust the pattern, I admit, did a post about this a video, mentioned this in a video the other day, is that there is a, a an expected pattern of intonation with a guitar that has three wound and three plain strings and it's very consistent and it stays the same, providing you use well-made strings from a decent manufacturer, you'll get the same result every time. So I'm taking my own advice which is trust the pattern and as a result I'm now adjusting based on that pattern I know it I know it to be dependable so I'm just going to go a millimeter each side of that that's my those and then I'm going to bring this forward a fraction and then this there and this forward a fraction now I'm reckoning that this will be uh, a pretty close to the intonation, just based off what I learned about intonation from the high E. Get under there. Okay. So I'm just going to bring all these up to tune. A little bit of extra stretch. E. Spot on. If that's the case, my guess on all the other ones should be good as well. Yay! See, trust the pattern. How close, how spot on that is. <laughs> Perfect. That's interesting. That's making it look like it doesn't like that position. Yeah. There we go. So, trust the pattern. I trusted the pattern, and it has come come through. Now, last thing to do is to refit the truss rod cover. Rally makes these in a sort of, ah, I don't know what I've done. Why does that, why does that look like it's a little bit closer than further back? Well, it 
is I'm going to just sand this tiny bit down. Um, <clears throat> pain, hold on. I'm just going to, the back of the adjustable nut seems to be pushing this just a tiny bit further forward than it was. So um, I'm just going to take it down by a fraction of a mil. And that way it will fit in without any trouble. Think of it a guess. It's not a guess, it's a it's a informed estimate. An experience-based estimate. And then we'll put it back and everything will be wonderful. There we are. Lovely. Yeah, so that's everything done and we're ready to go home. And this will head off back to Quinn on Monday first thing. Uh, I don't send guitars on Fridays because I don't like them sitting in warehouses and trucks. Now, I don't imagine for a second anything bad will ever happen to them. But it's been a, uh, I suppose it's been a sort of just a policy of mine not to do it. And because I've got 100% no damage, no loss on probably around 2,000 sends now, I'm not about to mess with that formula. So whether it's a slight little bit superstition or whether there's anything in it at all, I'm going to continue not sending on Fridays and continue not messing with a formula that's clearly worked well so far. And I'm sure you will understand that. Now, just um, a quick little final thing. On here, I did earlier on at home reduce down the height of the pickups, um, and I'm going to keep them quite low. They, they were both very high, but this one, because of the steep rake of this neck, and it's unusually steep, it does it kind of mean that this needs to come up to match it. All right? And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be anywhere. Um, there's a rule of thumb as guidance that, and all it states is that uh, the closer to, the closer the, the poles, the magnetic poles are to the strings, the greater the output or the yeah, the greater the output of the pickup in terms of volume. That's some, just sort of a, a kind of mantra. Uh, but the less the tonal dynamic is. So the lower, the further the poles are from the strings, the lower, smaller the output, the quieter it is, but the more tonal dynamic. And of course, if you've got an amp to amplify it, then you don't need it necessarily to be the most powerful it can be, particularly if having it lower and less powerful gives you a better tone that you can then crank your amp up a couple of notches to make it work better or sound better. So there we have it, the Rally GL300, my first <laughs> true love <laughs> colour. And um, oh yeah, I was just going to check that one thing, the jack socket. Um, and then we're ready to go in its case and I'll give it a test play. Um, I think the tone I was hearing earlier on at home also may well have had to do something to do with uh, the strings and how old they were. Yeah, this does need tightening. Um, so I think um, it was very misleading. I think it, they may have been, they were too high to begin with, but I don't think it was helped by the fact that the strings were ancient and sounded cruddy. So it should be different now. There we have it. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for sending it down to me, Gwen. Um, I hope, uh, I was very touched, I will say this, uh, very, very touched by um, your email, your first email in which you talked about me keeping you company during tough times of your recuperation from your illness. And that's a real honour for me and um, I'm glad I was able to <laughs> help uh, anaesthetise you and put you to sleep while you needed it most to recover. Anyway, um, I wish you all good strength and health in 2023 and I hope that this um, this guitar plays a, a healthy part in it. <laughs>